Hey, what's up? And welcome back to another episode of the Relationship Schools podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaddis. Good to be here. Shouting at you from Boulder, Colorado. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. Thanks for sharing this with a friend. Thanks for following me on social. I'm a little more active right now on Instagram. If you want to hang out with me there, leave a comment. I'll get back to you. At Jason Gaddis. That's my Instagram handle. And if you want to ask me a question live, one of the best ways to do that is go to relationshipschool.com forward slash training. That way you'll get the latest and greatest live web class um, where I'm teaching something live. And you can ask me a question. Cool. Uh, make sure you subscribe there. All right. We've had a lot of intense podcasts lately, and um, I hope you're enjoying them. In this episode, we take a little bit of a detour and get back to your questions. Uh, This is really important to me that I continue to try to answer your questions. And uh, all of these questions are from listeners in the Relationship School community group on Facebook. So thanks everybody in that group for keeping that group real and alive and for your questions. And I'm a little delayed, but here I am answering a few of them. Uh, There's questions coming up here. Okay, I want to talk about Kristen's question here. And... um, She asks, my husband has built the life he has now, the job, the wife, the house, two kids, blah, 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 while on antidepressants for six years after sobriety. He came off the antidepressants without telling me last year, and that's when the major withdrawal happened, fighting, sweating the small stuff, short fuse, etc. At first I took it personally because I didn't know what the sudden change was about, then I noticed he hadn't refilled his pills for months. We went to counseling, it lasted three weeks. He walks around the house, ignoring me, no eye contact, not even a hello, all he wants to do is be left alone, to recharge a battery that seems to need a lot of recharging. I recently gave him the ultimatum that if he doesn't go back to the antidepressants, we will split up because I can't take this anymore. Uh, Do you believe some people need to be on antidepressants for life? I feel like my relationship is being held together by a pill and his willingness to take it. That's intense, right? What if things are good for a while and the next time he decides to go off them and we're back in this place? Yeah, I'm having a hard time understanding my role and what even my boundaries should be. Let's talk about um, someone who's depressed for a minute. A lot of you might be, you know someone in your life. I mean, just about every one of us knows someone who's depressed. Now, there's a big difference between clinical major depression that gets diagnosed by a psychiatrist that then gets prescribed antidepressants versus a lot of us when we're feeling down and unmotivated, I call that just kind of my LGD, my low-grade depression. Uh, I fall into this once in a while. And this is very different, though, than like a pretty clinical depression um, that it sounds kind of like your partner has, Uh, Kristen. I'm not sure. Regardless, it's good to know what you're dealing with. That's why I'm mentioning that. Um, I've done a number of episodes on depression, uh, at least a couple. And what I think is the most effective form of treatment, by the way, is psychedelics. Um, And uh, you can... Now, just now, psilocybin treatment for depression is legal, I think, in Oregon. And it's going to be probably legal here soon in Colorado. Anyway, there's, there's things that we can do to treat depression that we couldn't do even a year ago, um, six months ago, six years ago. So I, I feel like if a person is depressed and they're motivated and they want to take care of the depression, they'll seek out the very best solutions possible. And medication does help some people. That's great. And I appreciate that. And your husband sounds like someone who doesn't prioritize you. And we could blame his depression, but it doesn't matter. He's in choice about that. And he's in choice about not prioritizing you. And if you don't feel like a priority, then that makes sense. And I would be advocating for myself there. Guys, the thing about partnership is... You don't get to sign up for a relationship and not show up. You don't get to do that in a relationship, in an intimate, committed, long-term relationship. If you do do that, there's going to be big consequences, like divorce, um, like more fighting, actually, not less, and other big problems. When you choose marriage, you choose partnership, you're choosing to like step up to the plate and not be so selfish, you know? So I feel like your husband's being pretty selfish here. Um, And again, if he's in his victim seat, he might blame the depression. It doesn't matter. 
What matters is I'm not showing up for you and I'm going to do everything I can in my power to show up for you because I love you. Okay, that's someone who's going to rock it out here, right? But it sounds like he's kind of invested in him him doing it his way, which that sounds like it's on at the end of the line here. Yeah. So it seems like you're on this. You're you're um I just wanted to give you a little bit of my opinion here professionally. Um yeah, I mean if he's not moving forward choosing a relationship with you, then yeah, it's time to it's time to part ways probably. This is a good one from Jessica. Uh, if I've trained my guy that I will take the lead in connecting, but now he isn't responding to my efforts to connect or initiating them himself, is there a way to turn that around? And Jessica's saying she's using trained my guy because she's heard me talk that we tend to train our partners. Like if you're overly functioning in the relationship and you're always the one bringing up the talk and wanting to talk about the relationship and you don't feel connected, you're training the other person that they don't have to do anything over time, right? You're going to take the lead all the time. So I appreciate the ownership here, Jessica. Then you're saying, I care about him a lot, and I believe he cares about me. He's just focused on other things. I'm trying to work my own head stuff and priorities and give him space to miss me, but I need more connection with him. I don't want every conversation to be two hours of catching up. I want to have a connected relationship. Yeah, you can have that, and you deserve that. Even astronauts and people on active duty have time to talk with their family back home, so I'm not buying the I'm just crazy busy with work stuff. Yeah, anyone who says they're crazy busy with work is um, they're telling a partial truth. Yeah, of course they're busy. We're all busy guys. Um, and that's not a good enough reason to not prioritize your partner. So if you prioritize work, no matter what your work is, you're deprioritizing your relationship and it's gonna have consequences. So, you know, we're all adults. It's like, if I choose to work all the time and I not hang out with my wife and my kids, over time, my family is going to go, grow increasingly frustrated and distant from me. And then I'm going to feel more and more alone. They're going to feel more alone. And it's going to lead to a, the chasm getting bigger and bigger. And eventually, one of us will leave or cheat or do something, right? Yeah, so, um, I mean, guys, uh, I'm saying this more now. You've got to stand for three when you partner. You're standing for yourself, the other person and the relationship. That's the agreement you make when you sign up for a relationship. Uh, if you didn't know about that, well, use your common sense and get hip to the fact that when you partner with someone, it's not all about you anymore. Yeah. Uh, if you don't, well, if you just want to be left alone, then divorce the person and go be single. Like, don't, don't bother. And then you can have your flings here and there. And maybe that's an okay life. I don't think it's remotely as... Um, amazing as deep partnership if you find someone who is going to go all in on this with you. Yeah. Yep. So keep advocating for yourself. Um, he needs someone else other than you to, to sort of get how dysfunctional this relationship is. So I would bring him to our workshop on conflict. I'd bring him into one of our coaches, or you could go to therapy uh, but with someone skilled, they're going to be able to reach this guy and help him see and take responsibility for his actions. That's just what needs to happen here. Yeah. Carrie, how would you address the question of polyamory monogamish is monogamish relationship structure from the context of post-betrayal? Do you think it's a legitimate solution for the betrayer to ask for this and the betrayed partner to accept? Or is it a cop-out to avoid growth? This is a complicated one. Um, it sounds like in your monogamy relationship, someone cheated on you and you feel betrayed. Um, so they chose to go outside the committed relationship and sleep with someone else, right? If that's the case, again, their actions speak volumes about who they are. And then if they don't come back around and clean it up and repair it to completion, that also speaks volumes about who you're with before they say, okay, like, like if I cheat on you and I feel shame and guilt about it, I, but I love you, I'm going to do what it takes to repair that. If I claim I love you, but, um, I'd rather go sleep with someone else, then I'm not going to be motivated to, and I have someone actually at my waiting for me, I'm not very motivated 
to deal with the pain and the immense conflict and the triggering feelings in my body that are going to come up with trying to repair with you because it could take us months, right? Weeks. It could be super painful and uncomfortable and hurtful and ugh. Why would I do that when I can go get dopamine tomorrow? So I think you're on to this person, Carrie, potentially. Um, I think it's adult, very adult of us after a breach of an agreement, for example, and this is a big one if you're talking about like sleeping with other people, a big breach deserves big repair, right? Little breaches, little repairs, but whatever. Repair until they're complete before we move on to the next thing. Um, yeah. So I think you're getting a lot of information about this person and, and yourself. Like, hmm, why would I stick around someone cheated on me and they want to open up the marriage now? You know, opening up your marriage is best done from a clean place of this is going to help us. This is going to actually help our marriage. And it's premeditated. We're going to actually think about this and talk, have many conversations about it. Not, it's not a reactionary thing because I all of a sudden have the hots for someone to work. You know, guys, conflict is tough. Working your shit out with another person day in and day out for years is tough. And it's not for everybody. And it, it is much easier to just find someone new to sleep with because it feels better. That's easier. Yeah. A um, couple more here. Patty, would being part of a men's group help during a relationship rebuild? I feel that men need a place to express themselves with other men who are working on their relationships. It seems that some men have a harder time getting to understand and communicating with women. Yeah, do better with male support. Absolutely. But how are you going to get him to go to a men's group, Patty? I'm a huge fan, as you guys know, of men's groups. I was in a men's group for six years. I led men's groups for years. And men's groups, and I'm still in a semi-men's group right now with a couple of close friends. So it's something I'll have always in my life is male friends that especially that when I'm in it with my wife that I can go to for support because you can't ask your wife to continually support you while you're in it with her, right? A dude needs like to, to separate out like, all right, I'm going to go get male support here. Um, well, you could get any, you could get female support too, but I, I think for men, it's actually extremely healing to be with other men. So, so yes, Patty, no brainer, but is your guy even remotely open to that is a whole different story. You can make that request. You can say, hey, it'd be awesome if you would join this. I've looked into this. I think it's going to help you. Yeah, you know, there, there are a lot of women that introduce their husbands to men's groups. And it actually, the guy changes the guy's fucking life. And from that day forward, he's like, oh my God, okay, thank you. So a lot of you in heteronormative relationships, a lot of you women actually do introduce men to personal growth. It's very powerful. But um, dragging, kicking, screaming, husband, or pushing, and he's just going to feel judged and criticized, and he's going to shut down. So these kind of things need to be ha handled, um, not delicately, but skillfully. Yeah. Emily, uh, no one talks about the sex slowing down in long-term relationship. What is healthy and normal, and what is not? When things are happy and comfy, but less sparky in the bedroom, how do you feed and stoke the flame of chemistry? Uh, I think I, I can't remember if I answered this, but I've, I've definitely talked about this a number of times here on the podcast. Uh, yeah, sex, it does slow down and sometimes it picks back up and then it slows down and then it picks back up. The ebb and flow of sex in a long-term relationship is just part of the deal. And um, what is healthy and normal? Only you and your partner are going to decide about that. I think not having sex for a year, years, I think that's not great for your relationship. There's something you're avoiding there. Once a month, sex can be fine. Once a week can be fine. Twice a week can be fine. It's, it's, I'm not going to take a stance on this because um, in my experience, it comes and goes and it becomes a really rich, fertile ground to grow and develop ourselves. And it's very common right after you have kids that sex changes big time for the couple uh, or you adopt kids, whatever, because the demands are really different. Yeah. So again, it's a crucible, as I've written before, and the two of you need to find your way in a way that's mutually beneficial and feels great. However the frequency is for you, you know? All right. 
Yeah, so these are just some, some of my answers here uh, to your questions. Again, thanks guys for asking. Um, one more here from Sarah. Uh, if you were dissatisfied in a relationship, how do you know if you're being too demanding versus there's something fundamentally lacking in the relationship? Yeah. Um, okay. Important question. I hear you saying, well, what if things have gotten boring or I'm just dissatisfied? I'm not psyched. I'm not inspired here. Maybe it's because, um, something's lacking in this relationship. Or maybe it's, I, I hear you saying, maybe it's, I'm, because of this, I'm now too demanding because it's lacking something. I don't think you're too demanding. Um, I think whenever we're dissatisfied in life, so let's just talk about our relationships and then we can talk about life. In our relationships, that's feedback that something's not working. And that feedback is designed to get us to pay attention and make a change and make a shift. And if we're on the growth path, we listen to this kind of information. We, we put attention on the things. Just like if I have an, a sore ankle or a, a, an issue with my low back, I don't ignore, ignore, ignore being like, oh, I'm being too demanding of my body. I say, gosh, I'm, I'm pushing my body in such a way that it's hurting my low back or I'm not stretching enough. I'm not going to yoga enough. I'm doing something that's not good for my back. What is that? Did I lift something heavy? Anyway, it's... It's getting me, the pain is getting me to pay attention. It's a signal. It's like a homing device. Hey, hello, pay attention to me. Your relationship is asking you for attention. And ideally, two of you come to the table and say, let's do something differently together. Let's change something together. Let's put attention on something that's lacking right here. So it can be a cop-out if your per person judges you as too demanding. It's like, look, I'm unsatisfied. And when I'm unsatisfied, I would hope my partner says, yeah, what's wrong? What's not working? Shit, that sucks. I don't want you to be dissatisfied. I want you to be fulfilled. I want you to be alive in your life and in, in your heart and like doing what you love to do. That sucks that you're dissatisfied. What am I doing or not doing that's got you feeling dissatisfied? That's the kind of response we deserve and we need. Versus being judged as, oh, here you are again, like talking about the relationship is like, it's so intense. You know, I don't know. No, so you're not too demanding. You're spot on and enroll your person in saying, hey, this doesn't work for me. Something's not working. Let's change. So if you bring your dissatisfaction in a non threatening, non-disrespectful kind of way that's actually like, show them your pain, cry, show them your tears, or you're like upset and say, gosh, I am so, I feel so alone over here. You know, that, that wakes a lot of partners up like, what? You do? Okay. Uh, all right. What's going on? You know, bring, bring that. Um, certainly you can offer empathy outward also. Hey, I know you're really busy. Hey, I know you're going through a lot yourself. And I'm dissatisfied. Yeah. Make the change, sister. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if I have a partner who flees every time we fight and hates repair, what is something I can own in this dynamic? Um, well, there's nothing wrong with someone fleeing every time you fight. And there's also nothing wrong with anyone hating repair. But the idea is they come back around. It's so vulnerable to, to repair and come back around. So... Are they willing, are they willing and able to come back around? And it might not be on your timeline, but do they come back around? Yeah. And so I, I think you could relax, um, own your anxiety and your fear and how alone you feel um, without it be, being like, I don't know, I need you to be different. Just like, oh, this is hard for me. And ideally, you have someone who's who notices, like, oh, shit, that sucks. That's not the impact I want to have on you. Okay. That's, okay, got it. That's motivation for me to, you know, mobilize here. So, yeah, express that. Something like that. Um, Samantha, how do you sit down with your in-laws and husband and set clear boundaries? My husband says he wouldn't be stressed if I wasn't stressed, which in return gets my in-laws pointing all the fingers at me. Well, you got to be a united front, Samantha. You got to ask your husband 
to have your back here. That you guys are a team and we don't throw each other under the bus. You're not going to triangulate and take sides here. You two are one side and it's like, you've got me. And if you, he can't get on board or you can't get on board with each other, you do the work so that you can. You always want to be a united front with your family of origin, in-laws, whoever. Like, yeah, we, we got each other. We are here. We're solid. So they can't split you, triangulate you. It's like, mm, no. Right? And you don't speak for the other person. You uh, behave in a way that's like, you're both right there. Or when you want to answer a question for your husband, you don't, you don't answer that. You say, I don't know, ask him. Yeah. That's how you start to set boundaries. Okay, cool. Um, good to be here with all y'all. Thanks for coming in. Okay, your action step today, folks, is to share the impact of what it's like to be with your person. So if you are in a frustrating relationship, I'll, I'll give you something. If you're in a great relationship, I'll give you something. So if you're in a frustrating relationship, we share impact here at the school. Remember, you listen to Sharing Impact 2.0. We first acknowledge with the other person what they're going through. And then we say, and I feel very alone. I feel really hurt. And you get eye contact when you're talking like this. You don't do it when you're side by side facing the wall or the ceiling when you're in bed. Okay? If you're in a great relationship, it's the same thing. Hey, I know you're rocking your life. I know you're stressed or whatever. And I feel so connected to you. And I feel so inspired when I'm with you. And I feel so grateful to have you in my life. Right? That's your action step. Eye contact though. Right? Okay, one final one, of course, is go to relationshipschool.com forward slash training if you want the latest and greatest training and ask me a question live and I will answer it. Cool? Okay, guys, thanks and be well. Hey, thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Share one of these videos with a friend. We want to help the planet get their act together around relationships. And you are one of them. So thank you.